Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The widow at Nain that we heard about in today's gospel lesson, this was a woman who was familiar with suffering. When Jesus came near to the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. This woman had already buried a husband, and being a widow, then she had placed all her hope for her son and her son, that he would provide for her in her old age. And now her son has died, and she goes to bury him. Throughout this entire time, the pangs of death surround her. The Lord has taken away the husband that he gave to her. He's taken away the son whom he had given to her. And with his death, the Lord has also taken away her financial security. The widow at Nain reminds us that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And none of us are strangers to any of this. The Lord gives many things to us. And he also takes them away at different times. The Lord gives health, but then he takes away health by allowing illness and disease to attack our bodies, even our minds. The Lord gives wealth and possessions, and yet, then through the changes and chances of this life, most of which are beyond our control, then he takes them. Moses says in Deuteronomy 8.18, it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that is, the ability to work. And yet, he even takes away the ability to work through disease, through an accident, or just simply through the deterioration of age. The Lord gives us all the good things of this life to enjoy, but then he often takes them away, sometimes as quickly as he gives them. And then, of course, there's death, the most bitter way our loved ones are taken from us. Like the widow at Nain, in the very midst of this life, we are in death. When hardships hit, when sufferings strike, when afflictions arise, our sinful flesh has two responses. The first is that the flesh will do everything within its power to dull that pain so it goes away. The second response of the sinful flesh, though, is to doubt God's goodness and mercy. Christ tells us in the gospel that the Heavenly Father gives good things to those who ask him. And yet when God takes away those good things that he has given to us, the flesh believes that God isn't good. In fact, the flesh wants to say that God is evil, even that he hates us. And this is just simply what the flesh does. St. Paul says in Romans 8, The carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And this is always true, but it's most especially true in the midst of sufferings and trials and hardships. Philip Melanchthon wrote, The flesh distrusts God, trusts in present things, seeks human aid in calamities, even contrary to God's will, flees from afflictions, which it ought to bear because of God's commands, doubts concerning God's mercy, etc. That strikes awfully close to home. Because that's precisely what our flesh is always doing once hardships strike. When calamities come, we distrust in God and instead put our trust in present things, the things of this life. We seek human aid whenever calamity strikes. The aid of other people or the aid of substances rather than God's aid. Even though God has told us to rely upon him and promised to help us in every trouble. God is the one who lays these afflictions upon us. The psalmist says in Psalm 66, you brought us into the net, you laid affliction on our backs. And so when we try to flee from our afflictions that God lays upon us, we sin because it's God's will that we bear up underneath those afflictions in patient endurance, in firm trust in his promised mercy. The sinful flesh, though, is incapable of all of this. Because it, by nature, distrusts God and doubts him concerning his mercy. And just as our flesh cannot raise itself from the dead, so our flesh cannot raise itself to such faith either. Jesus, alone, through his word, does both. 
Jesus comes to this suffering widow at Nain, and he has compassion on her in her moment of suffering, and he tells her, do not weep, not as a command, but as a comfort. And by his compassion, Jesus wants to silence the flesh's distrust in him. He teaches this woman, and all who will hear and believe, that he is compassionate and merciful. He doesn't want her or anyone else to doubt his mercy, to disbelieve his compassion for sinners. And his compassion moves him. He came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And he presented him to his mother. Not only is the Lord compassionate and gracious, but he's mighty, he's powerful, he is able to help. He is able to resurrect this young man to new life. And by presenting this young man to his mother, Jesus shows her his mercy, creates faith in her heart which trusts that mercy. For Jesus teaches her that he is with her in the midst of her sufferings. So even though we, are hard-pressed on every side, even though we are perplexed, even though we are persecuted, he will deliver us at the time that he knows it is best for us. And even if he does allow us to be struck down by disease or misfortune or even death, he will deliver us still from every evil. In fact, sometimes it's by taking us out of this life that he delivers us from greater evils. But he teaches us in all of this so that we do not despair of his mercy when we suffer, when we are afflicted, when we are at the moment of death. But that so we might love him, pray to him, expect aid and help from him, and even willingly obey him in our afflictions. And since the sinful flesh is powerless to do this, and let's be honest, even if it had the power to do it, it wouldn't, Christ does for us what we are unable to do for ourselves. He raises us up from the spiritual death which Adam and Eve plunged us all into by their sin in the Garden of Eden. St. Paul writes to the Ephesians, You he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We were once sons of disobedience, living according to our flesh's lusts, living according to the desires of our wicked minds. We were as spiritually dead as the young man in the box at Nain was physically dead. But Paul goes on. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And so he shows us by his law, in his law, our sinful nature. He shows us our sins each day. He shows us our inability to rise from such spiritual death so that then in the gospel he might raise us to new life by forgiving our sins, by giving us new hearts which are animated by the Holy Spirit, by giving us clean hearts in which the Holy Spirit dwells so that he might bear his fruit in us. And part of that new life, that we now live by faith in the Son of God, is that we suffer the right way, not the flesh's way. The flesh looks to God in sufferings and distrusts him and curses him. But the new man says along with Job, though he slay me, I will yet trust in him. The flesh looks to human comforts in the midst of afflictions. But yet the new man says along with the psalmist, This is my comfort in my afflictions, for your word has given me life. Whatever afflictions God sends, no matter how difficult they may be or how different they may seem from everyone else's, God promises help and aid and comfort and mercy to all who come to him 
humbly seeking him and humbly penitent, trusting in his mercy. The sinful flesh throws up its hands and thinks it'll die in whatever hardship God happens to be sending it at the moment. But the new man in Christ says with the psalmist, unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my afflictions. The flesh can't endure hardship with joy. But the new man can and does because he is animated with the Holy Spirit. The flesh, it grouses about every trial and tribulation that God sends. But the new man says with St. Paul, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Knowing that the Lord gives and that the Lord takes away. And that he gives and he takes away for our eternal good. That is what allows us to endure every hardship with patience and trust until he delivers them and unloads them from us. Whether God gives or whether he takes, we know what it is to be full or hungry, as St. Paul tells the Philippians. We know what it is to abound and to suffer need. And we know how to endure all of those things. It is just as Paul tells them, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is why St. Paul tells the Corinthians in today's epistle lesson, do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Don't lose heart, he says, when hardships hit, when suffering strikes, when afflictions arise. But rather pray the prayer that St. Paul prayed for the Corinthians, in, or excuse me, the Ephesians, in today's epistle lesson. Pray to be strengthened with might through Christ's spirit in the inner man. Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Dear saints, that is a prayer that God loves to hear because he himself inspired the apostle to pray it for the Ephesians and for all Christians including you. Christ promises that God the Father will give the Holy Spirit to all who ask, and the Holy Spirit is given to strengthen you in that inner man, the new man of faith. For he strengthens you by the gospel. By faith, Christ dwells in our hearts so that we may daily grow in precisely what Paul asks for, the comprehension of God's love for us in Christ Jesus. We grow in our understanding of his love as he richly and daily forgives us all of our sins as we come to him in penitence. We grow in our comprehension of his love as he strengthens us so that we endure every hardship, we bear up under every trial, and we suffer all things in patient trust in his mercy. We grow in the comprehension of the love of Christ which passes knowledge as we believe more and more that the Lord gives and the Lord takes, not out of spite, not out of punishment, not out of hatred for us, but that all things that he gives and takes are for our good, especially our eternal good, so that we might remain steadfast in the true faith, so that we might not fall into carnal and fleshly security, so that we may persevere in faith until the end and be saved. That's how we suffer, and that is also then how we will die, by Christ's strength and the comprehension of Christ's love. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise. We sing the offertory on page 22.